Hello and welcome to Pleasant Grove Community Church. So glad you have chosen to worship with us today. As we prepare our hearts, prepare ourselves to worship, I want to share a verse from you. It's from Zephaniah 317 and I find it both encouraging and fascinating. Listen in. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. That's the encouraging part. Now listen to this. He will exult over you with loud singing. Did you hear that? God is the one singing. God often inspires our singing, but this time it's God who himself is singing. So when we come and worship, we're not just singing to God, we're singing with God. Keep that in mind as we now prepare ourselves to worship. Hear this call from Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my God and King, and praise your name forever and ever. I will praise you every day. Yes, I will praise you forever. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. Everyone will share the story of your wonderful goodness. They will sing with joy about your righteousness. I will praise the Lord and may everyone on earth bless his holy name forever and ever. Let us worship. to anger, swift to bless. Your hand has guided us through every situation. Your loving kindness hasn't failed us yet. God, you are my God. You are my God. I will live to see glorious day. God, you are my God. You are my God. I will live to sing your praises, God. Joy of my heart, you are my rock. You've been faithful through This is my Father's world, 
Now it's time to come together in prayer. And I just wanted to remind you that our missionaries this month are the Pacific Justice Institute. So they specialize once again in defending religious freedom, parental rights, and other civil liberties. So we'll be keeping them in prayer this morning as well. Now if you'll bow your heads with me and just prepare your hearts, I'll lead us in prayer in just a moment. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for all of the wonderful blessings that you bestow on us. Thank you for this beautiful day and a wonderful week. We thank you, Father, for just all the beauty around us. Even though it's been shrouded in smoke, we still appreciate the fact, Lord, that there's so much that we can be grateful for. We just thank you, Lord God, for everything that you're doing in our lives and in the lives of our church family. We do remember the Pacific Justice Institute this morning and just ask, Lord, that you would be with them as they continue the service that they provide to those of us that need to be defended. We appreciate them defending our religious freedom, parental rights, and other civil liberties. And we are so pleased, Father, that here at Pleasant Grove Community Church, we can help to financially support PJI. Bless them and be with them, Father. We thank you too, Lord, for curbing the COVID outbreak at the villas. We prayed about that a couple of weeks ago, and, and we have now heard that they are COVID free. And we just thank you again for protecting our families that live there. And not only protecting those families, but all of us, Father, you've been so gracious to us in keeping us safe and sound from this ugly virus. We do pray for those in our church family, Father, who are recovering from illness and or surgery. We would just ask that you would keep them, comfort them, cause them to sense your presence, and heal them quickly. We also pray for the overall health of each of our body members, Father whether that's spiritual health, physical health, or emotional health, Lord, just continue to work in our hearts and our minds. Just draw us closer to you. Father, as we think abroad and, and at our country at large, we pray for all of those here in California that are suffering from fire loss. We also pray for those in the Southeast who are victims of the recent hurricanes. We just ask, Father, that you would be with those that have lost homes, have lost loved ones, as they continue to dig out and get back to what will be a new normal for them, Lord, we just ask that you would show them your grace and that you would help each one of us to find ways that we can reach out and help and provide them with resources, Lord. We thank you for your grace during that difficult time. We also... Pray, Father, for our nation during this period of unrest. We recently had a young man shot in Minneapolis, and we heard his mother pleading that protesters would stop doing damage and stop injuring one another and protest in an inappropriate way. And Father, we 
join with that, that mother of this young man and just ask that you would be with our people and help them to see that damaging other people's property is not the way to peacefully protest, Lord. We just pray that you will turn their hearts to you. We also pray for those that are in countries where there are new COVID outbreaks, Lord, and also the concerns that we hear from our medical professionals about the twindemic when the flu season meets the COVID se season, Lord. We just pray that you will be with our medical professionals and those that are working on cures as well as vaccines, Lord. And we just trust you as Christians who love you and have faith centered in you. We just trust you to keep us safe and sound. But we would pray for others that this will be a time that they will be drawn to you. And Father, we come together now and pray the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, normally this would be the time when we would be taking our morning offering if we were all able to be together. But even though the building is closed, ministry is still continuing. So we do ask you to continue to send your offerings in. They really make a difference in our ability to do what God has uh, tasked us to do here at Pleasant Grove Community Church. There are two ways in which you can give. The first is to mail in your offering to the church office at 1730 Pleasant Grove Boulevard, Roseville 95747. We do check the mail daily. Also, you can go online to our website at www.pgcc.church and follow the prompts there. Just make sure you set up your personal profile before you start designating what you'd like to give. We love each and every one of you and thank you for your continued support of our ministries here at Pleasant Grove Community Church. God bless you.
Christ to make me righteous in God's eyes. This river's depths I cannot know, but I can glory in its flood. The Lord Most High has bowed down low and poured on me His glorious love, and poured on me His glorious love. Righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with Himself, I cannot die. My soul. With his blood, my life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior. Good morning. My name is Marilyn Bennett, and I lead several Bible studies here at Pleasant Grove Community Church. We will be reading Romans 4, 16 through 5, 5 today for the sermon. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that are not. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words that was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him, who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our suffering. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. And character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Check your rearview mirror. 
Do you remember that when you were first starting to learn how to drive? It was one of the instructions that was given to you is like, check your mirrors, but particularly check your rear view mirror. And if you were early on, you might glance at it for a second and then took your foot off of the gas, maybe put it on the, off the brake, put it on the gas, didn't realize you'd had the car in reverse, and then bam, ran into something and realized, you know, I should have checked my rear view mirror. Uh, good hint, good tip. But we, we remember those kinds of things, like remember to check your rear view mirror. It means like look behind you because your rear view mirror is what? It's really for you to be able to, to know like what's going on around you, what's going on behind you, to know if there's someone going to try to pass you. But it's a great way of knowing your surroundings, right? I mean, it's important for us to, to check on that stuff. And the, the principle behind that is really to just glance at the rear view mirror, just Take a look, glance at your rear view mirror, check your side mirrors, but just glance at them. You don't want to train your eye on them too long, but you want to be able to know what's happening around you. And, uh, and that's a good thing. And, and in this passage that Marilyn just read for us a few moments ago, the Apostle Paul is, is really encouraging us to look back and look at a person's life. Look at Abraham's life. And take a look at this person and see how they are demonstrating their walk with God, how they're demonstrating their their faith in God, which is a good thing. We want to look back and see what's happened in this person of faith's life so that our faith would be encouraged. We would learn insights about what it is to trust and place our faith in you. So we look back, don't we? We want to do that. We want to see how Abraham demonstrated a kind of faith that in Scripture then Abraham is called the the father of faith. What a distinction to be called the father of faith in Scripture. And, And not only for like those of Jewish heritage, but also those of faith, those Gentiles, those believers that we're taught that Abraham is the father of faith. So we want to learn, if anywhere we want to go to learn about faith, let's go to the father of faith because that's going to be the person that's going to really give us some wonderful, wonderful insights, the father of faith. And we see that uh, Abraham's life, and one of the things that we learn about his faith is he has this amazing determination to keep focused on the promises that God has made. In fact, he is so focused on those promises that even his surroundings, even the destination that God is calling him to, he doesn't even know where that is. He's not sure how it's going to take place. He's making decisions to follow God obediently without knowing the outcomes, without really knowing where God's going to send him or how it's going to be possible. So in a sense, Abraham's faith demonstrates an ability to trust God without knowing all the ins and outs of life, right? I mean, it is a huge, a huge opportunity for us to learn to trust God without having everything in front of us. And that's hard for a lot of us. For a lot of us, we want to know exactly what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, or we'll try to order our life in such a way that we can kind of control things around us. Not so from Abraham's life. I wish I had more faith. Have you ever said that or thought that? I'm sure you have. I know I have. I wish I had more faith. Or someone said that to you, and you just thought for a moment, or you thought about people around you that were really seemed to be faith-filled people, and you thought, boy, if I could just have a faith like they have, it would be awesome. And we wonder, wow, I just feel like I have a lack of faith sometimes, and we wish we had more faith. I, I've had countless conversations with people that I've sat with who have made that statement. I just wish I had more faith. I wish I had a faith like yours or like so-and-so's. I wish I had more faith. Wow. We have a longing to have a stronger faith. And so we, we want to look at Scripture to help us understand how did people get the kind of faith they had? Or how did they live out their following God when he calls them to follow him? How do we do the things that God asks us to do in a way that exhibits faith or growth in faith? A maturing faith, not an immature faith. But the father of faith, Abraham, is a great place for us to start. 
So we look back at his life. And we also look back at other people's lives in Scripture, because isn't that really what the Bible's about, right? The Bible is the story of God, so it's the story of many, many, many stories of people and their faith. And when we look at them, we're looking at them not so that we can do things exactly like they have, but we learn from them. We watch how they struggle at times, fail at times, but succeed at times with God. We look at the stories of people recorded in Scripture because they give us insights and hope and encouragement to live a real vital faith with God. And that's what Scripture teaches us. So we, we dig deeply into Scripture to look at people of faith. We also can look at our own life. You remember there's a chorus, uh, if you remember, and it, it's like, it goes like this. It's like, count your blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. I'd sing it for you, but that'd probably end the service, so I won't. But the counting your blessings is an important part of it because it is us recounting, looking back in our life at what God has done in our own life. And you can think of it just for a few moments, and you could say, wow. That's right, when you start recounting, God was with me at this time. Or when I went through this, it was challenging or difficult, but God was there with me. And some of the most vital things that we remember are the times when maybe we still carry some of those um, scars in our life. And, and yet they're, they're like permanently embedded in our memory and in our life because they were challenges that were incredibly difficult. And when we meet challenges that are difficult in life, or we come into situations like that, sometimes we'll ask ourselves a couple of questions. Maybe we'll say something like this. Maybe we'll say, think to ourselves, I've just got to figure out how I don't even have to deal with this. I can't deal with this. How can I get around? I just don't want to even deal with it. And that might be one response that we have. I don't even want to go into this situation. A second one might be, how can I how can I just get around this situation? How can I just get by it and move on with my life? But Scripture is really teaching us that when we're faithful people, we really look to walk through whatever situation it is with God. Just like the series that we completed, to go through, to walk through. Faith is what God wants to take us through in order that we find passage through it, but that our faith increases and our trust in God increases because we know that we don't walk through it alone. So rather than just saying, I don't want to deal with that, or I'll just bypass that, or I'll try quickly to get around that, it's no like, how would God have you and how would he have me walk through a challenging situation? When we see that in our lives, they can be very, very difficult. But those times that are most challenging, when we look back at them, can be some of the most significant for us to know that God was with us. You've had those difficult times. I've had those difficult times. One of the most challenging for me is when my sister uh, was diagnosed with cancer. And I remember just coming around her and our family coming around her and walking with her through the different stages, her surgeries, and the chemotherapy and radiation treatments and after those things and the challenges of walking, watching her and walking with her and being with her and seeing her kind of struggle and get better a little bit and then sink back down and eventually succumb to that and die. And God took her to himself. And, and knowing that even during those difficult times, God was walking her and God was walking us as a family and me as her brother, God was walking with us through that challenging time. And those, those are imprinted deeply on our life. We have those. And yet, can we trust God in those? Can we trust that God will be there with us as we walk through those very deeply ingrained challenges in our life? Because that's what faith is. Faith is to trust God no matter what we're facing. Not to turn from him, but to really trust him. Wow. Remember those things. We don't want to, we want to look back. We want to look back at our own life and the experiences that we've had. We want to see where God's been with us along our journey, but we don't want to get fixated there. 
We don't want to just get stuck there. We want to be aware of our surroundings, right? We want to be aware of what's happening around us, not just what was behind us. At my house about nine o'clock at night, every night, there's kind of a, a habit that we go through. It's kind of like wrapping up the day a little bit, and, and uh, it's at nine o'clock at night, and and my dog and I, we head out the front door and we make our way out the front door and just kind of get him settled in for his last walk outside before coming back in to settle down for a night of rest for him. And it happens every, every, uh, every night about nine o'clock. And he and I are ready to just walk out the front door. And at our house, after you get at the front door, there's a kind of an entryway of about 10 feet or so. And then there's two steps that go down to kind of a parking area. And uh, we went out on Tuesday night, we walked out the door and we kind of bounded out the door and down the two steps and got onto that flat area of pavement. And just as we got past those last two steps, I heard this sound, kind of a, I don't know if you can hear that. That's not a good sound, but turned around and we had just bounded right over top of a rattlesnake that was nicely sitting right up against that bottom step. And we had just walked right over top of that rattlesnake. And so the first thing you do is make sure you're far enough away from the snake. Then I grabbed my dog and then we ran around the whole house to the backside and opened the door and got him into the house. Went, put my long pants, my jeans on, shoes and socks on, and then grabbed a couple of uh, sort of snake fighting utensils that I have, told my wife she came out with me. It's always good to have an assistant. And, uh, but as I looked at my assistant, she was had her phone out and she was texting people and taking pictures. And I'm like, no, no, we need to deal with this snake here. So we did. So there's some special ways of taking care of him and we were able to do that. But, you know, I can get so into the habit and so can you. We can get so into our own habits of how we live that we become kind of oblivious to what's going on around us. Even good things that God is doing or even situations that we might find ourselves in, we might entirely miss something wonderful that God's doing because we're so into a habit of the way we do things or the way we see things or whatever. Some people get so focused on the rearview mirror in their life that they kind of stay there. Um, they can't seem to move past their past. They're always recounting their past. And they can't seem to move forward with any confidence. It's like they've got one foot on the brake pedal of their car when they're trying to go forward. And they really aren't advancing very far. So tied to their past that they they've really are missing out on the adventure of life with God that God has things to move all of us forward in, that our past can become a kind of a constraint for us to actually experience kind of fresh new revelations from God and, and an openness to explore with God what he has for us. And we can get lost in our past and not move forward. It's not bad to look back. It's not bad to remember. Scripture tells us oftentimes to remember to look back at our past and to see where we've been and to remember the blessings of God. Those are all good things. And to let our mind and our heart recall all of God's guidance for us, his care for us and his direction along our path. And, and those are some times when we can remember the deep times when God has stood with us. Can you imagine if a person tried to drive forward in their vehicle and the whole time, but they were looking intently only in their rearview mirror? Like, what would happen to them? Can you imagine that if somebody decided they were going to drive, drive wherever they were going to go, but they were just going to look in their rearview mirror? Wow, it'd be a calamity, right? I mean, they'd be crashing into stuff. They, it would be a disaster. And so it is that, like, we want to look in our rearview mirror, glance as it were into our past, but keep focused forward. That's huge for us. As we look at this passage in Romans 4 for just a few moments, let me just point out a few things. The Apostle Paul here is really engaged in trying to help people understand really the central, uh, the central issue of faith. What is faith at its heart and core? And there's a lot of loud voices kind of calling out what they think is important about faith. 
For some people, it's all about their voices that are yelling about their heritage and their background and their nationality and all that kind of stuff. And those are the voices that are calling that way. There are other voices that are calling out and, and, they're, and they're challenging and they're, they're calling out that it's important that what you've done, what you've accomplished, that is what you need to listen to in terms of having a faith. And there are other voices that are, that are calling out, not, not, your, not your heritage and your pedigree or all that you've accomplished, but these other voices are talking about keeping the rituals and the rites that are being placed on you. You just keep those and you'll be okay. And yet Paul says, no, that's not what's going on here with Abraham. In fact, before all of those other things seemed to be happening in Abraham's life, he was centered, first of all, on God. And in connecting with God and listening to God and being obedient to God, that other stuff is way, way secondary, not important. Why is that important to us? Because our faith rests on the fact that our character and relationship with God is not based on any of those things either. It's based on a trust in God and what God has accomplished. I love that. It says that, that Abraham's faith demonstrated his hope and belief in the promises of God. And that's huge for us. What God had promised, Abraham was diligent to seek and to follow. Because he believed and trusted God and that God would complete the promises that he'd been given. And because of that, he's called the father of faith. And not just for the Hebrew people, but for all people of faith in God. That's important for us. Abraham definitely wasn't perfect, was he? When we look at his life, it reveals a lot of stumbling and bumbling, uh, a lot of shortcomings and blunders. You don't have to look too far, but it kind of gives me hope for all of the times when I bumble my way through stuff. Abraham did as well. But he is still called the father of faith because he continues to trust in what God has called him to live out. And he believes in the promises of God. Paul draws us to this resting point in Abraham's faith. And he says that that point of rest is this, that God provides the righteousness for Abraham to live into. That Abraham is made right with God because of his faith. And Abraham's faith, again, was based on his belief that, quote, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. His faith was in God completing his promises. And so it says it, it was credited to him as righteousness, that kind of faith. Our righteousness, our credited righteousness is this, quote, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Wow, that's kind of a mouthful right there. So what is that really saying? But what it's saying is that when we believe, when we place our faith in what Christ has done, that's it. We believe that what Christ did is true. Not only is it true, what we believe that it's for us, that Christ died for us. And that is credited to us as righteousness because our faith isn't in ourselves, what we can accomplish, our pedigree, how many things we've done. It is all based on what Christ has done. Our faith is placed in the living one and what he has done. Paul would have us look back at Abraham's life so that we could see that his was an active faith. He wasn't passive. He demonstrates that active faith. He looks forward. He moves forward. He steps forward. He steps out beyond where he has been. His focus is not on a rearview mirror in his life. He exhibits a faith that is in action, a faith in motion and a future-focused faith. Do you have a future-focused faith? I don't mean just about heaven. I mean about what's going on in your life today and tomorrow and the next day. What is God doing out ahead of you? Those are important questions to be asking and to be asking God, God, take me through each day. Be with me through each day. We might say, well, how do I have that kind of a future-focused faith? 
How do we do that? If you want to have a strong faith, a dynamic faith, a forward future focused faith, your mind, your heart, and your soul need to have the right attitude and have the right attitude in place in your life. You can't have a vital faith with wrong attitudes. It does not work. You can't have a sour heart or a divided will. It does not work. You have to have the right heart and attitude with God to have a strong faith. You can't be self-serving, but you must be humble before God. Abraham was. And have an attitude of humility toward other people. Charles Swindoll said this, Want to be truly great? Walk by faith, trusting God to renew your attitude. Wow. He links our faith with our attitude right there. He said this again, It takes God to make the, right, the heart right. When I have a wrong attitude, I look at life humanly. When I have a right attitude, I look at life divinely. That's a good word for us. Abraham's attitude, his heart, his soul, and his mind was to put his hope in God and what God would do. To trust God even in, when he didn't know the outcomes, even when he didn't know the destination that he was being called to get to. But he knew and he believed in the promise of God. He believed God beyond human possibilities. Let me say that again. He believed God beyond human possibilities. I don't know what you're facing right now. I don't know what you faced in your past, but are you believing God to provide beyond human possibilities? Because that's what God does. God does things when we trust him beyond what we think is possible, what we think we can arrange. God steps in and does things beyond human possibilities. I'm so glad we have a God like that and that God wants to do that in your life and in mine. To live beyond our humanness is what that's saying. We too believe in a Savior that did things beyond human possibilities. We believe in a Savior that went to the cross, that conquered death, that rose to new life and draws us to himself to forgive our sins and make us entirely new people. That's a God that is beyond human possibilities. That's who we believe in. That's a God of miracles. That's a God who cares and is compassionate about our life and every situation that we face in it. I read something uh, this week, again, that Charles Swindoll had written about some truths about faith and some considerations for us when we think about our own faith. Just listen to these. I, I think they're fantastic. First, when I am able, by faith, to see God's plan in my location, my attitude will be right. In other words, when I can see God at work in my location, where I am, God sent me here. God placed me here. I am right here. When we can see in our heart and in our attitude that God has put us where we are, our location, for a purpose, not that just we found our way here or happened to drop into this place or stopped here at a bus stop. No, that God has placed us in this location for a purpose with the right attitude. God can do amazing things. God got you right where he wants you to be. You may not feel that. You may say, I don't know why I'm here. What could it possibly be that I would land here in my life? But you're there. And if God is with you, he is right there. And he's got you in a place that your attitude when right can reveal the power of God in you to be effective in that place. That's the place. Here's the second one. When I'm able by faith, to sense God's hand in my situation, my attitude will be right. In other words, when I can get by whatever situation I'm in and know that God is in that situation, it would challenge me to have the right attitude because God is in this situation. I'm not trying to avoid it. I'm not rising up and waking up in the morning going, oh man, I just... I just don't even want to face today because of what I see out in front of me or what I feel or what I think might happen. I don't try to skirt the edges and get around a situation. I see that God is in the situation with me. Is that amazing? God wants to be in your situation. He's placed you in a place and he's placed you in situations that he can take you through. 
He can take you through. He can take us through. God is that kind of a God. Your situation is your opportunity to live your faith and see God at work. Just think if you chose not to be with a harder attitude that God was in your situation. Wow, your opportunity to see your faith grow would be greatly diminished, maybe incomplete. You may not even have an effect that God placed you in that situation so that you would have an effect on people. Now God's giving you a situation for your faith to grow and for God to do something in and through your life. Here's the third one. When I'm able, by faith, to accept both location and situation as good, even when there's been hardship in the process, my attitude will be right. So given where my place is, I find myself. Given in my situation what's coming across my path, if I can see my place and my situation as good, even then, if there are hardships around me, I can see God at work. And I can look to him for my growth, for my ability to touch other people, for in humility to know that I can bring Christ into my life and situation that others can be affected. Are you that kind of person that can overcome place and overcome situation to see God at work even in hardship? And so I'm going to trust you, God. I'm going to trust the promise that you'll take me through. I don't know the way, but I know you'll take me through because you've promised to be with me in that journey. I love how Peter wrote it in 1 Peter 6 and 7. He said, in, in all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Don't cave. Stand. Don't cave in. Don't give up. Don't give out. Stand. Stand with God who stands with you is what that's talking about. These things that have come across your path, they're difficult, they're challenging. We get that, but stand with God. Learn with God. Have your faith grown and proved because you've stood through them with God. What a word for us. A faith-filled life means that in all of the difficulties and differences that come across our path, we don't see them alone. We see them with a living, powerful God who has a destiny for us, who has opportunity for us, and who has growth and maturity of faith for us. There's a reason why your, why your rearview mirror is so small and your windshield is so large. It's not bad to look and glance back. And we learn from that. And that is an important part of who we are. To look at people of faith. To recount in our own life what's going on. And to see how God's been with us in the process. But, but we look forward, don't we? We look forward because we know when we look forward, it is the challenge of a growing faith. It is the challenge to be people who are moving forward stepping forward, hoping forward, and believing forward with God. We need forward people in a good way, don't we? We want to be people who God says, I have a promise for you. I have opportunity for you. I have a growing faith for you. Trust me and follow me forward. Let's be that. Let's be that. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a forward-moving God. You give us amazing, amazing examples and models of people in your word 
that time and time again saw them grow in their faith, challenged at times, but grow. God, may we be those people when we look at those lives, we don't just see them as past stories, we see them as encouragement for us to live into, that we would learn from them and move forward in you. God, help us to be forward people who live beyond our location, who live beyond, who live beyond our situations and who find a place, an opportunity to live out our faith as we live out your promises. God, would we be people of promise who forward walk with you. We pray that, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Hey, well, thanks for tuning in, checking us out, being with us again today, wherever you are. We're delighted that you've made that connection with us today. And you know, you can, if you're not a part of uh, Pleasant Grove Community Church in any way, you can check us out on our website. We'd love to have you do that. If you've got questions, you can let us know. Call the office. We'd love to follow up with you. Perhaps something jarred you today a little bit where you go, man, I'd like to know a little bit more about that. We'd, be lo we'd love to just have conversations and talk about that. Help take some next steps to move you forward. My hope is that this week... This week as we enter challenges, we, things we come across that we weren't even expecting, we see opportunities to have God walk us through in those ways. Hey, I pray that God will just bless you this week, that you'll know that he's with you, that he is a forward-moving God, and he is nudging you, pulling you, dragging you, or stepping with you, but he's got you moving forward and focused forward not just in a rearview mirror. Hey, God bless you. Have a wonderful week.